that she did it. That's what my husband thought I was saying. <laughs> Well, if you'll allow me to open this up in prayer. Our God, we thank you so much for this day. And Lord, I thank you for uh, your people and for their faithfulness to your ways and your kingdom work. And Lord, as we've uh, talked about and studied the, the job you've given us to be evangelists where you place us, God, I pray for each of these people and I pray that you will commission them as missionaries in their work centers and in the in, in the places where you take them. And God, uh, tonight as we continue and as we finish up this study uh, into a look into evangelism, I pray that you'll speak to us through it. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right, so uh, our final lesson. Some of you have been telling me that you've been keeping up on YouTube. And so if you did keep up on YouTube, if you could kindly on the list here at the end, uh, go ahead and mark the ones you did uh, do. And then at the end also I'm going to... Um, I've got the post-test that I've got to do on you and a survey with that as well. So we will get to that at the end. But tonight, as promised, we're going to focus a little bit on our workplace <coughs> in the mission field. Now, I, I know that a lot of times, when you hear missionary, what do you, what do you usually think? What do most people usually think? Uh, guy in a hut in India. Yeah, the guy in a hut in India. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Bugs. <laughs> Bugs. <laughs> what was that? What was that? A place rough in the Kunsan in terms of you know, amenities, facilities. Absolutely. You know, using salt to preserve meat. And, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I remember as a child, we attended this church uh, where a lot of times missionaries would come. And also, it seemed like every one of them wore what I call a pajama top. You know, kind of that indigenous sort of clothes, but it looked like, it almost looked like they just, as long as you come put the top of my pajamas on and tell people I'm a missionary. We usually think of exotic locations. We think of austere situations. We think of danger. You know, we've, we've all heard the stories of the missionaries who, who uh, went and, and tried to evangelize among cannibal peoples and among people who, who, peoples who rejected them. And, and, and even heard some amazing stories like even here in in Korea, if you ever study into the, the story of the gospel coming to Korea, uh, it was martyrdom that actually spread the gospel here. And so uh, we, we oftentimes hear these stories, and that's what we think of as missionaries. We don't typically think of ourselves as missionaries, but the reality is God wants us to be missionaries in the field where he's put us, whether he's led us to be a a maintenance senior NCO or a dentist or or, or what or, or maybe he's led you to type paint stripes on the North Pole. It really doesn't matter. God, when he redeemed you, wanted you to share his love with the world. Now, I've got a photo here that I feel like kind of gives a good description of faith in the military. Okay? This picture, I took this picture. This was Christmas Eve 2010. It was at Forward Operating Base right in Asadabad, Afghanistan. Okay? Uh, our FOB had several missions. One of them, this is uh, called a 777. It is a 155 millimeter artillery uh, mm. rifle. And it has an effect, big guns. In fact, that's what we nicknamed them, big guns. And uh, you knew when it got shot, had an effective range, depending on the <coughs> shell and the powder load you put in it of around 17 miles. Ooh. And so it could it could put a projectile up. <clears throat> and uh, there's an area right here, by the way, and this area is nicknamed Rachel. I never found out why they called it Rachel. But what was happening was, it was Christmas Eve, we were going to be having a, a, a Christmas Eve celebration. We were having a party. And I was, as the chaplain, was kind of the one who was in charge of it. Imagine that. Uh, and we had troops in contact right on the other side of Rachel. And, or or they, were, they were receiving contact from right on the other side of Rachel. There was a road that went back over there. If you, if you ever saw the movie Restrepo, anybody ever see the movie uh, the Restrepo about the Corn Gall River, Corn Gall Valley? It's right on the other side of that. That's where Restrepo is. <laughs> and so uh, we had troops in contact. And even though it was Christmas Eve, um, we had people that had jobs to do. So in the midst of going around and inviting people to the Christmas party, and you know, we have uh, people in elf costumes, and these are all, uh, actually every, all of them are, are soldiers. Uh, she, she was an E-8 Master Sergeant Army. Uh, she was a major, just retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. He was a Lieutenant Colonel specialist. Uh, he's a contractor, but he's out in, actually he's a country music singer. He just put out an album. Uh, but at any rate, 
We had gone out to invite people to this party, but then the battle had to happen. Now, there's a couple things that, that I want you to see in this. For those who were dressed up as elves, this situation felt very awkward. Okay? Uh, because you've got the triple seven going off, and it, when it goes, it, you know it. It, it. it actually, you can literally see the air move. And, and so the situation was a little awkward for them, and so they really hesitated. They're like, gee, big guns, they're, they're, they're about to uh, launch some artillery. But beyond the awkwardness, the people there were very welcoming. Uh, the soldiers who were operating the big guns were very welcoming of the, the invitation. And as soon as they got done, they came to the Christmas party. And so what I say to you is oftentimes uh, efforts to live out our faith in the workplace can feel very awkward. But awkward does not mean unwelcome. Sometimes people like the fact that you are willing to do something different. Many times they, they wish they had the courage, the boldness to be different themselves. And so though you may feel like somebody wearing an elf costume in an artillery pit, still they want you there and you need to be there for that. So uh, that's kind of, I think, a visual of what evangelism looks like in, in the Air Force, what faith looks like in the military. So... In, in previous lessons, I introduced you to the concept of the diffusion of innovation theory. Uh, it, it was uh, propagated by Everett Rogers. It's the, the study into how people adopt innovations. And the innovation that uh, I, I mentioned to you in session two was the gospel. The gospel being an innovation, being something that uh, would be utterly new to someone who received it. Now, when we talk about evangelism in the workplace... I, want you, I would like for you to embrace a concept from the DOI theory, and that is uh, the concept of opinion leadership. Okay? And the definition up here of opinion leadership is the degree to which an individual is able to influence informally other individuals' attitudes or overt behavior in a desired way with relative frequency. Way back in session one, if, if you recall, uh, we took a look at two different types of airman evangelists. We took, looked at the one, it was the guy that was you know, cornering people with gospel tracts in the hangar. And, and we agreed that while technically some people might consider that evangelism, would it be welcomed in the Air Force? No, no. Probably not. It's probably, those are oftentimes when uh, we as chaplains get invited in to converse with leadership about their airmen. Those are the situations that they have. It's the, it's the Bible thumper, if you will. <laughs> And uh, I like to thump my Bible, but uh, it's those individuals. But then I brought to you the other example, the, uh, the, the go-to good, good guy. Uh, the guy who everybody in the unit likes and the people uh, trust his opinion or her opinion. Uh, they, they do live differently. They don't live like everyone else. But when people have issues, they go to that person, okay? That person has what is called opinion leadership. And opinion leadership is not tied to a job title. It's not tied to a rank. It's not tied even to an age. Uh, basically what it is, it's the ability to influence other people informally. Now a lot of times I think we as Christians <coughs> miss out on this because we're afraid we're going to be like the elves in the bomb pit. We're afraid that uh, what we have to say, what we have to think is not going to uh, be accepted, so we keep it to ourselves. Now, how often does that happen? How often do we have opportunities to speak up? Do we get those? Every day, I would say. I think every day we do. We get those opportunities to say something different. Uh, I had an opportunity last week. Um, wasn't when I saw it. I actually was in a car accident downtown, <laughs> and uh, with a parked car. So it was one of those situations where no one saw. And uh, I went over to uh, security forces and. Uh, an airman who will remain unnamed said, well, nobody saw it. It didn't happen. <laughs> I said, well, that's not what Jesus would say. And that's what I said to him. And he's like, um, that's right. <laughs> now, the reality is, a lot of times we have those opportunities to say, well, I'm not going to do this, or I don't, I don't believe we should do that, because my Christian faith says I should do otherwise. And that's legal. That's lawful. You can do that. You're not, you're not at that point saying to the person, well, my Christian faith says otherwise, and you better accept my Christian faith or you're going to go to hell. No, you can speak a good word for Jesus. And 
that is completely legitimate. That is, you, know, you can do that. And that's what opinion leadership looks like. Again, like we looked at last week too, living a life that displays holiness, that displays hope, that displays a commitment to the scriptures, uh, plus speaking up when you have those opportunities equals opinion leadership. It, it, because you have credibility and that credibility turns into an opportunity to have a voice. So uh, I do, would like for you to embrace that concept of, of opinion leadership, the ability to influence those around you. Now, a couple other concepts that I want us to look at tonight are the concepts of homophily and heterophily. And I did not make these words up. Microsoft Word thought I did. <laughs> but I did not make them up. Okay? And these are concepts that, recall several times I've told you how we need people in every career field and in every rank and position who are committed to tell people about Jesus? Homophily and heterophily explain why that is. A homophily is the degree to which individuals who communicate are similar. Uh, we all have similarities about us, right? I would say, would you say this room is pretty similar in some ways? Mm -hmm. We're all, I've talked to many, uh, many of you. I don't know all your individual testimonies, but I've talked to all of you, and I know that you all love Jesus, and you're committed to the faith. We're all in the Air Force. We're all Americans. We're all stationed at Coons on. So uh, these are some things, some ways that we are similar. And similar communication makes it easier to communicate, right? So if I talk to you about uh, needing to update the OI for the DFAC uh, because we have an ORI coming up and, uh, and, and, and I need to print off my LES so that I can go over to the MPF and get my records changed, everybody here knew exactly what I said, right? Didn't have to explain it, because uh, even though I talked in acronyms, how do you think that conversation would go with a <laughs> civilian that's not affiliated with the military? They might respond with, I don't know, E-I-E-I-O. I mean, that, that might be exact, about as much sense as it would make. So homophily does make communication simpler, okay? It does uh, make it better. But then heterophily is the complete opposite to the the degree to which individuals who communicate are different. In this group, we have some heterophilia as well. Different career fields, different ranks, different parts of the country, uh, different genders, different races. Uh, so we are different as well. So when we look at these two concepts, both have to be present in evangelism. Now, going back to the concept of opinion leadership, what we recognize is though the homophilus, that's also a word that Felchuk doesn't like, Networks are more effective at communication because we can communicate better. Such networks often prevent a barrier to diffusion in that they tend to exclude innovators. That's a fancy way of saying groups where everybody is alike don't get new ideas in. It takes an outsider to bring a new idea into a group. How many of you are from a small town? Several of you are from small towns. I'm from a small town. Uh, thinking back to your experience in your small town, do you remember that person who went away and came back? Maybe you're that person who went away and came back. Maybe it was when you were in high school or something like that. Wasn't that person just the coolest person ever? I remember uh, there in Tioga, Louisiana, there was a guy that I went to middle school with him. And then... Um, his parents were military, so they went to England for two years. His dad was a reservist, so he took it like a two-year activation and then came back. And he came back when we were in high school. And, and you know, in high school, it was all about do you own a Chevy or do you own a Ford? <laughs> and his parents bought him a Porsche. <laughs> and that was unlike any experience any of us had ever had. It didn't sound the same. It didn't look the same. The engine was in the wrong place. <laughs> but guess, guess what car got attention? And guess who got attention from people? It was the different person. He brought a new concept <coughs> into that rural Louisiana town that we had never seen. The same is true in relationships. As much as we may like being around those people that we're most comfortable with, those that we're not comfortable with need us there to bring the gospel. Because they're not, I guarantee you, they're not sitting around talking about the gospel if none of them know the gospel. 
Uh, they may have heard the gospel. They may, uh, use, they may use Jesus' name in some ways we would not agree with. Uh, but the fact is, heterophily is essential to being an opinion leader in a relationship. I also want us to look a little bit at personal networks. Uh, there are two kinds of personal networks I want us to consider. Uh, first of all, there are radial personal networks. Uh, these are essentially networks that are linked to a, a single individual, uh, but the individuals don't interact with each other. Okay? Think of it as the friend of a friend. Uh, have you ever had friends of friends? The uh, craziest situation uh, that happened in our family recently, my uh, wife's baby brother got married. Married a, a young lady named Jessica. Jessica's a sweetheart. Well, it turns out Jessica grew up in Mississippi. And Jessica went to college at Mississippi College. That's the actual name of the college. And Jessica's uh, campus minister was a lady by the name of Michelle Davison, but whose married name was Michelle Brown, who I went to high school with. And so what we found was Jessica's that, you know, me, you know, I know Michelle, Jessica knew Michelle, but it wasn't until then that we knew Michelle, but yet had that influence. Just a crazy situation. But radial, uh, and I'm going to show you a picture here that will explain it better than I ever could. Uh, but radial personal networks are those that are linked to a focal individual, uh, but, um, but do not interact with each other. But then there's interlocking personal networks, and these are networks where all interact with each other. So think of it like a circle of friends. Uh, and the fact is, radial personal networks are more effective at diffusing innovation. Uh, they are uh, because you have that one, you, you have the ability for that one person to get information into the group that everyone else does, doesn't have. And the interlocking one, uh, it's another way of looking at it, uh, allowing that other information to get in there. I guess I didn't have the picture, so I'll load it up to the YouTube uh, for you. So the fact is, what that all comes down to is to be an opinion leader, you've got to be a necessary outsider to a culture. And every culture has its necessary outsiders. And those necessary outsiders bring about innovation within a culture. Uh, if you're ever uh, really curious about this, I'd like for you to study into the effect of Chinese culture upon the cultures of the world. Every culture that has ever thrived, like in the past 200 years, has had a Chinese immigrant population. For some reason, when the Chinese moved in, the economy is stimulated. Because they seem to have that, that uh, knack for being necessary outsiders that, that innovate. Uh, in the same way, you as a Christian, putting yourself into situations that quite honestly are awkward. And uh, we, we talked a little bit about this last night. I won't go into details on it. Uh, but uh, putting yourself in those situations, you become that necessary outsider. You become the salt of the earth. You become the light of the world. That which is different around you. So, evangelism starts in the workplace with opinion leadership. Now I'd like first to look a little bit into DOD policy, okay? Now, how many of you ever heard it said you can't evangelize an Air Force? Has anybody heard that in the past? Heard it in the past? You know, we've heard the stories. We've heard the, a lot of times, sometimes they're urban myths, sometimes they're not so mythical, but we've heard the stories of people getting in trouble for evangelizing. However, Department of Defense policy allows us the right to practice evangelism. Uh, this is uh, actually uh, right here. This is a, a, a quote um, from the Pentagon spokesperson, uh, who, by the way, is Navy Lieutenant Commander Dave Christensen. Uh, this was cited in an article. He was interviewed in this article. And these were his words. Uh, first of all, it says that uh, Service members may freely exercise a religion in ways that are conducive to good order and discipline and that do not detract from accomplishing the military mission. So there's a couple things I want us to see in there. Conducive to good order and discipline. So there's a time and a place, right? And do not detract from accomplishing the military mission. Back to our photo. What if the elves had, like, pulled the people away from the gun? <laughs> yeah. People on the other side of the hill needed the gun. It would have detracted from the military mission. So uh, we were able to do that. But then also, uh, Lieutenant Commander Christensen was careful to point out that service members can share their faith or evangelize, but not, must not force unwanted 
intrusive attempts to convert others of any faith or no faith to one's belief, which is called proselytizing. So here we see a little bit of a differentiation between evangelism and proselytizing. Uh, and, and we'll get into kind of the quandary uh, there in a moment. Now what is, what is the Air Force's policy? How many of you read AFI 1-1 recently? Uh, yeah, it was revised. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it was revised to the advantage of the faithful. Yeah, I remember I had actually already started the proposal on this project when it was revised, and I was very thankful to see that the revision happened. And then I had to rewrite two pages, but uh, it's okay, right? Uh, but the AFI says that airmen have the right to individual expressions of sincerely held beliefs. And it gives a whole list there. Unless those expressions would have an adverse impact on military readiness, good order, discipline, unit cohesion, safety, or mission accomplishment. Okay? So, you as an airman have a right to hold your beliefs. It also specifies actual and not hypothetical. That's correct. And, and when it comes to religion, it, you know, it goes into more detail. A lot of times commanders would deny religious accommodation requests because, oh, what if this happens? What if that? Well, that's hypothetical. If it's really causing you an impact, you can't do it. But then, and this one specifically speaks of leaders and how leaders have to balance their own free exercise of religion uh, with the constitutional prohibition against government establishment of religion. And uh, the reality is that the more senior you get, the more careful you have to be. And uh, you, if you're supervising people, or even if you don't supervise those people, but wear a certain, have a certain level of rank, your influence or your perceived influence can become uh, a little bit of a challenge for you. So you have to be uh, very careful. I, I know a lot of times people will say, well, you're the chaplain. That means you can go uh, share Christ wherever. Well, actually, it means that I'm the chaplain, and because of that, I'm a little bit constrained at times because, you know, I've got oak leaves. I've got the cross. I, I, to some people, I represent God. And so uh, that can be perceived as coercive in nature. So uh, the AFI does say we can share our faith, but it does give caution. Now, back to, the, back to our friend Lieutenant Commander Christensen and what he said about evangelism versus proselytizing. Does anybody see a challenge with that? Just off the top of your head. Did, did he define a line? Really? Can you back up one? Well, it's kind of that idea of unwelcome is welcome. Right. We don't see that he actually drew a line and said... But that's not forced. Unwanted. Unwanted. You've got the unwanted, but it's still a little bit gray. In fact... Uh, What's that? Intentionally, I'm sure. It's intentionally so. And, and I have to say that my denomination saw it that way as well. Dr. Russell Moore, who is from the uh, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, these were his words. After all, who defines what is proselytizing and what is evangelism? What could seem to be a friendly conversation about spiritual matters to one service person could be perceived or deliberately mischaracterized as proselytizing to the person on the receiving end. The fact that this has been raised at all in such a subjunctive fashion could have a chilling effect on service personnel sharing their faith at all. So there's a little bit of a hiccup there, a little bit of a gray area, because the definition says you can evangelize, but you can't proselytize, but one person's evangelism becomes one person's proselytizing, another person proselytizing. So how can we as airmen evangelists practice <coughs> proper evangelism? Before I go there, is there anything in this definition that reminds you of another issue in the Air Force? Yeah, Sark. Bingo. <laughs> Does it look a little bit about that whole consent thing? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, one person's, uh, and, and, and hopefully nobody in this room does that, because Scripture says, Speak very heavily about intimacy outside of marriage, but you know, one person's trying to score is another person's stalking. Mm -hmm. One person's evangelism, another person's proselytizing. Yeah, what people think is a mutual event turns into a he said, she said, I felt forced, just like it could be a mutual, you know, shared conversation about religion, and then the person said, Hey, I really thought that person was pushing me to make a decision 
for their faith. You know? Absolutely. So there is no guarantee that when you share your faith, there will never be consequences. Now, scripturally, there were consequences when people shared their faith. But we need to be wise as serpents as har and harmless as doves. We don't want to invite consequences upon ourselves. If we're going to offend someone, let's let Jesus offend them. Let's not ourselves be the offender. So, uh, for some solutions, uh, first solution, get consent. Uh, I think it's fair to say to someone, when you're forming a relationship with them, and you've got that opinion leadership with them, and uh, it's a co-worker, and, and you feel like, okay, this is somebody I go to lunch with, we talk about a variety of issues, to be able to just simply say, hey, um, these issues you're going through, I, I think that there might be some wisdom from my faith that might help you here. Would you mind if I share this with you? You see what I'm saying? It, the, same, the same solution in the SAVR program is the same solution in the evangelism program. Make sure that you're very clear on your intentions. Make sure that people know they're not being coerced. They're not being cornered. Uh, they're not being badgered into it. Make sure that they know, uh, for example, if you're in a, a position of seniority, that you're not using your authority to force them into a conversation. The same practices that work there work here. And, and again, going back to that program too, a lot of that gets mitigated by actually having relationships with people and getting to know them and developing that comfort level. So, you know, get consent in sharing your faith with them. And then... Uh, also, and we do that in counseling too. You know, even in counseling, I, if, I don't know a person's faith background, but I think Scripture's going to help. Uh, I'll ask them if, if they would allow me to, and a lot of times they say no. And, and I don't even always close in prayer. And they, they say, well, I'd really rather you not pray. I'm like, okay, it breaks my heart, but we're going to do it. And just remember, peer-to-peer -peer conversations are safest. Again, that's why we need people at all levels doing evangelism. Peer-to-peer -peer conversations are always safest. Uh, but when there's real or perceived authority, there's a greater risk. Does that mean you can't evangelize? No. It just means you've got to be more cautious. You've got to be more clear about your intentionality. You need to uh, be more uh, willing to agree that the conversation is a consensual faith discussion so that it doesn't backfire on you. Is it a completely foolproof system? No. Uh, people can always get offended, but again, let's let Jesus do the offending. Let's do our best not to offend. So with that, as an epilogue, what I want us to do as we finish this seminar is uh, I'd like to uh, point to you Daniel, who of course is in the book of Daniel, as one who is an example of a biblical, of an effective workplace evangelist. Uh, we find him introduced in, in Daniel chapter 1. Now, a little background of the book of Daniel. It was written during the exile of the Jewish people. It was written about 550 to 600 years before uh, the birth of Christ. And uh, Daniel served for 76 years. Imagine having to work for 76 years to get your retirement. <laughs> Daniel did. And uh, he, he served in the court of four different Gentile rulers. If you ever read the book of Daniel, it wasn't the same leader he worked for the whole time. Uh, but he worked in the, in the court of four different Gentile rulers. What I think is interesting about Daniel is he wasn't an enlistee. He was a conscript. If you, if you read in the book of Daniel, he didn't really have any choice in the matter. Uh, the, uh, the, the emperor Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar said, you know, collect all the wise ones for me and bring them here. Didn't have a choice in the matter. So, in a lot of ways, he was a little more than a slave. But, nonetheless, he had the opportunity to have an influence on, on uh, some pretty powerful people uh, in, in his life. And as we look at his life, we see, or if you recall, I gave you three attributes of biblical evangelism through the study of the Old and New Testament. And we see all three of those present in his life. First of all, his faith was communal. And in Daniel chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, it says, Among the exiles assigned to the king were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Even there in exile, there in Babylon, 
Daniel had a church. He was plugged into other people. And so we find these four men, and, and there may have been others as well. In fact, I would, I would suggest you there probably were others as well. But these four, these, these three men uh, that we, we always, we always call Daniel, Daniel. You ever notice that in church? We call Daniel, Daniel, but the other three, give them the names, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, give them the pagan names. But we give Daniel the, the Jewish name. Uh, I don't know why that is, but nonetheless. These four men, as we look through uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2 and beyond, they became a, not just a partnership, but they became a fellowship. And for us to have an impact in our work centers for Christ, in our world for Christ, we have to be plugged into other people. Uh, there are those people who don't feel like they need the church. There are those people who don't feel like they need other Christians. And uh, they... They, they don't have that encouragement. They cut themselves off. They, we're not, as I mentioned in last night's message, we're not meant to uh, be uh, all, all by ourselves. We don't have all the gifting uh, to ourselves. And as I even mentioned to you in the first lesson, not all of you have the gift of evangelism, even though we're all called to do evangelism. But how it looks may be different. One of you, may, you know, as, as Paul said, you know, uh, I planted a false water that God made it grow. And the fact is, some of us may, uh, our job may just be to sow seeds, and then someone else will plant, uh, pick the fruit. But we see these four men in relationship with each other as they were in relationship with God. Every time in the Bible that, that God does a work in someone's life to introduce himself to them, we see the community involved. And so Daniel's faith was a communal faith. But then secondly, Daniel's faith was an attractional faith. In, uh, starting in verse 8, we find it said that uh, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Now, what was wrong with the king's food? There could have been several things. It could have been uh, a sacrifice. It could have included unclean food. And, and maybe it was pig. We don't know. The Jews didn't eat pig. We really don't specifically know what it was about that food outside of the fact that Daniel felt that to eat that food would have been defilement. So Daniel and, and Hananiah and, and, and Mishael and, and Azariah come up with this plan. And they say, and, and, and this is where the whole idea of the Daniel fast, part of that comes from. I did it once. It worked. It's good to fast. You know, we talked about that in fasting. But Daniel and his friends come up with a plan. He said, test your servant for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now, ten days, is that long? It's not going to have a big impact. You can do most anything for ten days. Ten days. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. It says the eunuch consented. At the end of ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh. That's what it actually says in Hebrew. Fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. That got the eunuch's attention. When we live out our faith, it should be attractive to others. And it is, because uh, we, our faith works. And I believe that as we are, take those opportunities to display that opinion leadership... I think people will see, as the Holy Spirit works in their life, to, to uh, cause what we live out to be attractive. Uh, the fact that, you know, as we look here around Kutensan, a lot of people, that what the, walk, the path they're walking is not very attractive. Um, was, it, uh, was, it, was it you, Michael, that's telling me about where you work is along the road from the main gate? <laughs> And, and about how, after big party nights, you, oh, yeah. you, you're swerving the whole time. It's the road of shame. It's the road of shame. <laughs> the vomit. I have to steer my bike to avoid the, the vomit along the side of the road. Yeah. That's, that's not attractional. No, that's not attractional at all. Uh, you know, the people that drink their entire time here at Coons on a way, it's not attractional. The people who catch STDs while they're here, it's not attractional. And some of those people are looking at you, and you, you're sober, and you've, you've got nice stuff that doesn't get broken, and you're not having to go to the clinic all the time. And some of them are going to take notice, 
And, and remember, we're praying for them. Remember we talked about that? We're praying for them, and we're praying for each other. And some of them are going to take notice and say, well, what's he doing, Deborah? The gospel is attractional. But then we also see that the gospel is relational. And again, Merriam-Webster defines uh, relate to be to show or to make a connection between two or more things. In verse 17 of that passage, uh, if you recall, the, the king, he, he, gave, he brought all the people, he brought all the youth in, he was going to train them, and then they said, you know, these four said, no, give us vegetables and water, they, they were fatter and better in appearance. Uh, it says in, in, in chapter 1, verse 17, it says, as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So, they were farther ahead, but we don't see the exact connection there yet. In chapter 2, we do. Uh, we see in chapter 2 that Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And, and, and none, of the, none of the wise men can, that, that he calls in, none of the astrologers can interpret this dream. And, uh, and, but then Daniel requests a chance to, to interpret it, and he does. And then uh, in verses 27 through 28, uh, we... Uh, we find Daniel say to Nebuchadnezzar, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mystery. So Daniel, there he is, he makes that connection. He says, King, it's not that I'm smarter. I'm not smarter, I'm not prettier. I don't have some insight that you don't have. My search engine isn't better. I'm tapped into something. And, that, and, and I'm going to make that connection for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. The connection to what I have that you don't have and what these other guys don't have is the Lord. And there are times people will want that in our life. And even when people do look at us, and again, that goes back to speaking, goes back to our elves in the, in the, in the uh, artillery pit. Uh, it, would it be safer, maybe socially, at times, when people look at our life going better, you say, that's luck. It's good genetics. It's, it would, but would that give glory to God? No. So give glory to God. And they may dismiss it. Or, or you even have fun with it. Like, like I could tell you, but if you try this, this is fun. Keep them in suspense. I don't know. I don't know if you can handle it. What are you doing different? I don't know. It's big. I don't know if you can handle it. You'll get, they'll be, I gotta know. I'm not sure about that. I don't really have to know. It's the Lord. Yeah. And then, <laughs> you know, just draw them right in. Make them hungry to tell. And so we see that Daniel is a great example of a workplace evangelist. Because uh, we see that uh, his, his faith was communal. His faith was attractional. It was a, a relational. And every... Uh, story of evangelism, we find in scripture, has those three elements to it. And so my encouragement for you, be those elves in the bottom pit. <laughs> Step out there at times, allow yourself to be a little bit uncomfortable, because there, there are people who will welcome that, and there are people who will need that. Um, be cautious, be wise, but be prayed up, and God will use you. Let me pray for you. God, we thank you so much that you have filled us with your spirit and you've given us a mission where you've placed us. And Lord, I lift up uh, these your people and commission them as missionaries in their workplace. Lord, help us to be the uncomfortable ones, the necessary outsiders, the one who, ones who bring in the heterophily, uh, the ones who are in the, the, the uh, radial uh, communication networks, Lord. Uh, the ones who bring new stuff into the room, uh, allowing us, uh, helping us to be uncomfortable maybe, uh, sometimes doing it, but recognizing that it's necessary. And God, I pray that your spirit will go before us and help us, Lord, to uh, be faithful to speak for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you folks very much for your commitment to this. And I do have a few things I need from you. Remembering, as I told you, this is for a class of mine. So this looks familiar to some of you. It was the pretest. It's the same form, okay? So what I need for you each to do is to fill out one of these post tests. And I want you to be as honest as you can be, okay? Uh, 
There's, there's always a temptation in these things. Well, I like chaplain scissors, so I'm going to mark them up. Or I can't stand chaplain scissors, so I'm marking them out. I ask for you to be honest. Also, I have this post-test, uh, post-seminar assessment. This will help me improve this class because uh, if if it, it may be something I might want to do again. And so I ask that you fill both of those out. But then thirdly, as mentioned to you before, I'm looking for some people to mentor. And how that will work is I would like to meet with you one-on-one -on -one six times. And we can go more in depth on these things. We can talk about your individual challenges with evangelism, maybe uh, with some of the scriptures involved. And that's the whole goal of that. And so I'm looking for uh, as many of you as is willing that I can do that with. And so if that interests you, uh, what I'd like for you to do is let me know. So you can let me know tonight. You can email me tomorrow. Uh, if I don't hear from you, I will, I will send out an email following up. That's reminding me that I need you to do that. But if you'd be willing to do that, that would help me out tremendously. So I'm going to let you guys write. So. You need a pen? I have a pen. That is the only pen. Well, you're not in the uniform. It's still soon. <laughs>